Tonight, the ex-boyfriend of a missing Richmond Hill woman is charged in her disappearance. This is not over. The bottom line is we need to find Elnaz Hajtamiri. The 37-year-old still missing after being violently abducted from Wasaga Beach exactly six months ago. Her former boyfriend, Mohamed Lilo, now charged with kidnapping as police continue the search. Plus, obviously, it's um, a problem if patients are not able to get in to see their family doctors. ER wait times in Ontario hospitals are hitting record highs. Could part of the problem be family doctors refusing to see patients in person? And... It, it was definitely my, my favorite childhood team. It was, uh, it was my dad's favorite team. We used to watch games together. Now Matt Murray can call himself a Toronto Maple Leaf. The team's new goaltender speaking to media today. This latest trade, though, proving to be divisive with fans. We'll tell you why. Good evening, I'm Kelda Yoon. It's been exactly six months since Elnaz Hajtamiri was violently taken from a Wasaga Beach home. Today, Ontario Provincial Police arrested and charged a man in connection with her abduction. As they continue the search for the missing 37-year-old, Dale Minukduk has the latest. OPP announced today they have arrested and charged Hajtamiri's ex-boyfriend. Mohamed Lilo, 35 years old, was arrested in Brassard, Quebec, and charged with kidnapping in connection with the January 2022 uh, abduction of Elnaz Hajtamiri. Lilo was arrested by OPP officers to be flown to Ontario to appear in court tomorrow. His lawyer tells CBC he will be pleading not guilty. Hajtamiri was taken by three suspects on January 12th. They were dressed in police gear but not actual uniforms, abducting her in what is believed to be a white Lexus SUV. Lilo was also charged with aggravated assault, attempted murder, and attempted kidnapping linked to an attack on Hajtamiri in Richmond Hill in December of last year. One other man has been arrested and charged for that incident. Another, 23-year-old Harshdeep Binner from Brampton, remains at large, wanted on a Canada-wide warrant. This is not over. The bottom line is we need to find Elnaz Hajtamiri. We need to find out what has happened to her. We owe that to her family. Haj Tamiri's whereabouts are still unknown. In a statement, her family writes they are grateful for the arrest, going on to say these past six months have been grueling and painful since her disappearance, as we've continued to search endlessly for her. We hope that the arrest of this suspect will bring us closer to finding her. Her family continues to appeal for the public's help. This is a picture of an ad paid for using donations from El Naz's GoFundMe page. The PR company representing the family says that with donations, they've purchased roughly $8,000 worth of ads that will be running in eastern Canada starting this week. Anyone with information is asked to call Crime Stoppers. Dale Manukduk, CBC News, Toronto. We've been reporting for weeks now about the strain on hospital emergency rooms in this province. Well, new figures out tonight show that ER wait times hit record highs in May. And some are now wondering if challenges getting an in-person visit with a family doctor are contributing to the problem. Our Queen's Park reporter Mike Crawley has this story. Sharon Minnell recently developed a severe sinus infection. Instead of being able to go in to see my doctor, I got a phone appointment. Her doctor prescribed an antibiotic, but the condition worsened, and she tried again to see the doctor. Said that I was really worried about what was happening. And that's when I got an email back saying they recommended I go to emergency rather than coming in to see him. She can't understand why she was sent to the ER for a sinus infection. To me, the emergency department is for emergencies. You know, you're bleeding to death, you've got a broken arm, something like that. The latest stats from Ontario Health show a record-breaking month in the province's emergency rooms in May. The average wait for first assessment by a doctor, the time patients spent in ER until they were sent home, or the time admitted patients spent waiting for a bed, all higher than ever before. Does some of the blame for this lie with family doctors for not seeing patients in person? Obviously, it's a problem if patients are not able to get in to see their family doctors in person in a timely way. While there are plenty of patients with stories like Sharon Manel's, there's no evidence that they're driving emergency room backlogs. The data we've looked at 
um, tells a different story than sometimes the anecdotes I think that we're hearing. Dr. Tara Kieran led research into how family doctors have balanced in-person appointments with virtual care during the pandemic. And we found no relationship that suggests that more virtual care use increases emergency department use. What is proven to cause more ER visits? Not having a family doctor at all. And your family doctor is the beginning, uh, the middle, and the end of your whole healthcare journey. So if you don't have that entryway, uh, you're going to end up in the eMERGE. Before the pandemic, more than 1.3 million Ontarians did not have a family doctor. There are no official updates to that figure, but with more doctors leaving family medicine than joining it, the number can only be getting bigger. Mike Crawley, CBC News, Toronto. A superior court judge has overturned the controversial appointment of a Brampton city councillor. A Brampton mayor, Patrick Brown, is calling the decision a victory for democracy. But one of his foes on council, who was part of that appointment, says it's not that simple. Lorena Redekop has the story. It's now uh, clarified that what they attempted to do was egregious, it was wrong, um, and it was illegal. Patrick Brown, together with his allies from Brampton City Council, on the Superior Court decision. A judge voted on a special meeting by council to vote on a replacement for then councillor Charmaine Williams. But the meeting was held before her seat was vacated. Days before the provincial election, in which she won a seat as a PCMPP. And let me say, say um, what happened was wrong. It was an attempt to seize control of the city uh, flagrantly ignoring the Municipal Act, thinking that these councillors were above the law. I think this is good news for democracy. Democracy has prevailed in Brampton. This is the first time that I've ever seen in Ontario. The judge's decision isn't the, is the judge's decision. It doesn't take away from what's actually going on at City Hall. One of the councillors who was part of that controversial appointment says he and others have issues with Brown as leader and they've called for investigations about financial matters at City Hall. It's typical of Patrick Brown, uh, distract, deny, deceive, uh, but uh, we're positive that uh, the investigations, five current forensic investigations going on, will uncover a lot of the truth. This is all less than a week after Patrick Brown was dumped from the federal conservative race over alleged finance violations. After a whistleblower who worked on his campaign came forward, Brown is now fighting that. There's a deep division between the two sides of Brampton Council. But now we've got a 5-5 stalemate, Brown and his four allies, the other five councillors on two opposite sides, and it's unclear if we're going to get the city, you know, the, the business of the city, you know, done, if these investigations can come forward publicly before the October 24th election. Plus, Brown still won't say whether he's running to be re-elected as mayor. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Brampton. Rogers says it will be crediting customers for five days of lost service after its massive service outage last week. And meanwhile, Canada's telecommunications regulator is demanding answers from the tech giant and considering calls for a public inquiry into the nationwide system failure. The CRTC has sent Rogers a list of more than 50 detailed written questions. The regulator wants comprehensive answers about the outage itself and how Rogers plans to prevent future failures. It's also seeking information about the impact impact on emergency services, past outages suffered by the Rogers network, and the company's promise to compensate customers. Rogers has until July 22nd to respond. A strike at Via Rail has been averted. Via and its main union reached a tentative deal overnight. Unifor, which represents more than 2,000 Via employees, says the deal was reached just hours before members were prepared to strike. That would have forced Via to pause service across the country. The new contract agreement still has to be ratified by union members. Meteorologist Colette Kennedy joins us now with a first look at the forecast. And Colette, overcast and rainy to start the day, but then the sun came through. Yeah, that's right, Kelda. So we had uh, several things in terms of the sky conditions and also a kind of a dipsy doodle with our temperatures. What I mean by that, they were rising this morning. Then those few mostly light showers pulled through. A few areas got a little bit more, but we really need a good soaking. Temperatures came down, though, with that and then back up with the sunshine later in the afternoon. So the daytime highs ended up looking like this with all of that sort of activity. And, you know, a bit breezy, but we'll find those winds continuing to ease 
ease off as they have been through the overnight hours. So we have mostly clear skies tonight, actually some pretty quiet conditions until we get into tomorrow. Now, there's a chance even in the morning, certainly I'll see increase in cloudiness in southwestern Ontario, but a chance even of some showers there. But primarily into the GTA, we're talking about mid to late afternoon to early evening where we get into the risk of some wet weather. Again, pretty light, scattered, just not the soaking rain that we really could use at this point. Tonight, 15 for that low, the high tomorrow, a cooler 24. Thanks so much, Colette. A gas leak this morning forced the evacuation of two condo buildings near Wellington and Blue Jays Way. A police say a high pressure gas line at the construction site was blown. Toronto fire crews say the leak has since been capped and the gas has been shut off. Access to roads in the area have reopened to pedestrians and vehicles and residents have been allowed back into the buildings. Well, planning to head to the Honda Indie Festival this weekend and due for another booster shot, Toronto will be hosting pop-up COVID vaccination clinics at some events and festivals this month. The pop-up clinics will also be at Bloor West Street Festival, Toronto Fringe Festival and Bastille Day celebrations. First, second, third and fourth doses will be administered to eligible residents aged five and older. Shots will be given out on a walk-in basis. No appointment or health card is required. Clinic details are available on the city's website. Indigenous organizations in Toronto will soon come together at a new location in Regent Park. I think we're more excited that we can host the community. We can invite the community in and we have space uh, to look after their needs, to host meetings, to host get-togethers. This is the first permanent home for the Toronto Aboriginal Support Services Council. The council is a coalition of 18 social service organizations that help support more than 85,000 Indigenous people who call Toronto home. The federal government is providing $2 million to support the purchase and renovation of the new office, with the City of Toronto providing more than half a million dollars in funding. The Toronto Maple Leafs' new goaltender met with the media today. Matt Murray is joining the team after a trade yesterday. Now, the goalie has two Stanley Cups under his belt. The latest move, though, still proving to be a divisive one with Leafs fans. Greg Ross explains why. I'm just super, super excited. Matt Murray says he's looking forward to a fresh start in Toronto with a team he once cheered for. It was definitely my, my favorite childhood team. It was, uh, it was my dad's favorite team. We used to watch games together. Being able to, to put on that jersey for the first time, I think, is going to be uh, something really special for me, as it is for, for a lot of people, especially uh, you know, a young kid that, that grew up in Ontario. But not all Leaf fans are sharing Murray's excitement about the move. I just think they have no chance to be a better team than they were last year, and obviously last year they weren't good enough. So it's a risk. Oh, yeah, huge risk, huge risk. Um, they have like a couple years left with Matthew's contract, right? And I, yeah, definitely worried about, um, again, the stability there. Murray will likely replace free agent Jack Campbell, who has become a fan favorite in Toronto. While Murray is a two-time Stanley Cup champion with the Pittsburgh Penguins, he has not been anywhere near as good the past two seasons in Ottawa and has battled a number of injuries. You're looking at a goalie who has struggled to play consistently well for a number of years. Those Stanley Cup titles and how amazing he played there. Um, that was a while ago now. The Leafs are betting a lot on this guy. And as much as I am optimistic about it, it can go south real fast. Murray says he's ready to put his troubles of the past two seasons behind him. My time in Ottawa, um, I don't think it went as anybody had uh, had expected. But uh, at this point in time, I'm, I'm really just focusing on, on the present and, and the near future. It's a move that could weigh heavily on the Leafs' front office. After failing to get past the first round of the playoffs the past six years, the future of the Leafs' president Brendan Shanahan and GM Kyle Dubas may rest on the shoulders of Murray. Dubas and Shanahan and everyone in that Leafs' front office, they're singularly focused on their vision for what it's going to take to win. Now's the part where they actually have to win, though. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. Welcome back. Today is Etch-A-Sketch Day. The popular toy was first introduced 62 years ago today and is still enjoyed by many, including one Markham teen who has been doing some incredible sketches on it. I met up with 17-year-old Erica Chin, whose creations on the Etch-A-Sketch has gained her 
a huge TikTok following. Tell me about how you got into all of this. What age were you when you got your first Etch-a-Sketch? I was about 10 years old when I got my first one, and it was actually, I watched the movie Elf, and he's like really good at Etch-a-Sketching. So then I got an Etch-a-Sketch, and then I figured, I wish I could do what they did, so I kind of started doing it. The rest is history. And yeah. since then, you've done like, what, hundreds? Well, <laughs> it was kind of, I, I took a break after. And then over the pandemic, a lot of people picked stuff up. So I picked up Etch a Sketch again. And then I kind of just kept going. And then I got into TikTok and went off from there. And TikTok, you have now over 100,000 followers, yeah. millions of likes. Cousin the Lotus can hear a pin drop. My thing has kind of become doing time lapses where I do a bunch of sketches all together. So these can take, I'd say about three hours to do. And then I kind of put it all together, together with the music. Her most popular one so far, this recreation of the Phineas and Ferb theme, one of her favorite childhood shows. Like building a rocket or fighting a mummy or climbing up the Eiffel Tower. And then I've also done like the periodic table theme song. There's hydrogen and helium, then lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon everywhere, nitrogen all through the air. And the Big Bang Theory. Neanderthals developed tools, we built a wall. We built the pyramids, math, science, history, unraveling the mystery. It all started with the Big Bang. Hey! What are some of your favorite drawings that you've done on an etch a sketch? I think one of my favorite was the most difficult one I did, and that was the Titanic. I did it over a span of a whole bunch of days, but I'd say that probably took like seven hours or so because I did shading and everything on that. But that was like the first like big one. This one she made permanent, which requires disassembling the Etch-a-Sketch and removing the powder inside. So for Etch-a-Sketch day, you did this, the logo for CBC, and this is not permanent yet. That one's not permanent, but it will be permanent. I'd say this one took about, I think, three hours. Yeah, so I kind of, I started with the outline, but I'd say the same thing that kind of took the longest was coloring it all in. Yeah, because when you color it, you're just, like I said, doing lines back and forth and you have to make sure it's all filled in. And then I'm going to do a little sketch of the minions. So the right knob is vertical lines and then the left knob is horizontal lines. The first part of the circle, you're turning the left knob clockwise and you're turning the right knob counterclockwise. Has it become kind of like muscle memory for you now? It that has, you're like going really yeah. fast? I don't really have to think about it anymore. <laughs> and voila, this one done in just 10 minutes. I think it's really patience because I feel like anybody could do this. Okay, mm. okay. <laughs> well, I you, don't know about that. <laughs> not anybody, but if, if you put the work yeah. in and you put the time in and you have the patience, I think you could get to a point that it's like, it's pretty impressive. And you are looking at a live shot of the Toronto skyline, a dry and mostly clear night, currently a comfortable 22 degrees in the city. All right, let's go back to Colette now with a look at your extended forecast and Colette, some cooler temperatures for the next couple of days. Yeah, that's kind of what we're looking at here. The temperature's actually dropping down a little bit below seasonal for a few days. So pretty comfortable. The nights, too, it makes for some better sleeping weather. We do have some scattered showers into the forecast again tomorrow, primarily into the afternoon and early evening. A little bit earlier, that chance for southwestern Ontario. The temperature's down and then up. What I mean is, yes, the next couple of days, they're a little below seasonal. By the time we get to the end of the week and the weekend, that's when they'll start to be uh, on the rise again and a dry end of the week as well. I know it's nice if you're taking vacation days or, or you're off to the cottage because of the sunshine, um, but we're really kind of behind for July. Th this month we should be getting into around 75 millimeters of rain. I know we're only not even halfway through, but we have had less than, well, around 10 actually. So just having a look at what's going on tonight with the clear conditions. Then as this disturbance comes through tomorrow, we get into some of those showers. A few areas may get a little bit heavier downpour, but really there's not a whole lot of moisture associated with this. In fact, the winds that have been coming through have been kind of drying the atmosphere. So that's what makes it more comfortable for sleeping at night, but also means there's not a lot of moisture to work with. Where it gets a little more significant, I've stopped this tomorrow late evening into eastern Ontario, but that's an area that's actually been seeing some of the rainfall, so doesn't necessarily need it as much as we need it towards uh, southwestern areas and around the Golden Horseshoe too. So 
As we look ahead to your overnight temperatures, this is how they're rounding up here from London and Sarnia at 14 to 16 for Windsor and Leamington as well. Around Toronto, we're talking about 14 to 15. In fact, even a little cooler Markham at 13 tonight. So if you do have the windows open, that is going to feel pretty good. You may not need that air conditioning. Tomorrow's daytime high, we should be closer to 27. We'll be at 24. That 27 is coming, though, in the near future. And there it is at the end of the week, Held. Thanks so much, Colette. Of mourners turned out today for the funeral of Japan's former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. He was shot and killed at a campaign rally last Friday. Abe's death shook Japan, where both political violence and gun crimes are very rare. The funeral service was private with just family and senior officials attending, but the streets were lined with people who came to pay their respects. Abe's casket was driven through Tokyo to the parliamentary district where members of the current government honored Japan's longest serving prime minister. The investigation into the shooting continues and a 41-year-old is in custody. Media reports say he may have blamed Abe for financial troubles faced by his family. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Finally tonight, the 2022 Emmy nominations have been announced and it's shaping up to be a historic year for the awards show. We are breaking records with the number of submissions received by the Television Academy this year, which tells me two things. One, production is at an historic high. And two, the quality of the shows we are all watching is also at an all-time high. HBO Succession has earned a whopping 25 nominations, including Best Drama and Best Actor for Brian Cox and Jeremy Strong. Ted Lasso and The White Lotus aren't too far behind, with 20 nominations each. And South Korea's Squid Game becoming the first non-English language series to vie for television's top honor. Martin Short, Sandra Oh, and Seth Rogen are among the Canadians in the running. The Martin awards Short. will be held on September 12th. And that is our show for you tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you back here tomorrow night at 11. Have a great night.